Welcome to the Accountants Exposed podcast, where we create light bulb moments for our listeners by exposing the journeys, secrets, and insights of some of the top players in accounting. This podcast is brought to you by Michael Edelstein, Director and Founder of Recruitment Expert, a specialist accounting recruitment agency working across Australia, New Zealand, and Asia Pacific. Ladies, gentlemen, and accountants, I had the pleasure of speaking to Beatty, the former auto partner in PKF. She's the only female I know that became an auto partner at such a young age, especially in a top national firm, and then decided to give all that up to pursue a new challenge in a tech startup. Today, she shares her inspiring journey becoming a female auto partner at the age of 26, and all the trials and tribulations that come with that. If you ever wonder whether partnership is for you, then make sure you listen all the way to the end. Might just make the decision a bit easier. Enjoy. Hi, Beatty. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Hi, Michael. Thanks so much for having I've, me. I've been watching your rapid rise through the ranks at PKF, where I believe you became the youngest partner to, uh, I think, not even just the PKF, but you told me the, the top 10 sort of global firms um, to have gotten there at the ripe age of 26. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, confirmed as far as I know. Um, the other thing I've noticed about you is you've been very vocal about um, women in tech and, you know, now you've moved to the dark side yourself, working for a tech company or a startup, I would think. Yeah, yeah. I think we're at scale up stage now at Yellow Canary. So yeah, moving to the dark side. I mean, it's really one dark side from one dark side to another. I mean, accounting <laughs> and auditing gets a pretty bad rap. So so does tech. So. so based on that alone, there's like a million things I could ask you today. So we'll start off with... I know, we'll start off your journey. What compelled you to get into accounting to begin with? Great question. As I'm sure you'll find out over the course of this conversation, I'm pretty offbeat. I am <laughs> kind of backtracking to where that comes from is I actually grew up on a chicken farm just north of Newcastle. Um, so about two and a half hours north of Sydney for anyone listening here in Australia. I... On that farm, we had something like 120,000 chickens every 10 weeks. Uh, And I grew up with three brothers who all had very conventional names, Jack, Patrick and James. Only girl, only one with a made up name to to get that out of the way up front. But that upbringing was particularly informative to not only my values, but what I wanted to do in terms of... um, not wanting to necessarily, I mean, wanting to, to do quite well and, and work hard. And You're the youngest as well in your? Uh, second oldest. Second oldest, okay. Yeah. So yeah. how did your parents come up with the name? Like you said, made up. <laughs> uh, well, back in the day when you used to get your ultrasounds on VHS tapes. Yeah, really, okay. My- <laughs> yeah, so we're, go- we're going back to the 90s. Um, my mum had written instead of baby number two, she wrote <laughs> baby number two because she had a bad case of baby brain and she spelt it B-A-D-Y number two. And then they thought, well, let's add an I to it and we'll call, if we have a girl, that's what we'll call her. So, <laughs> <laughs> and if it was a boy? Uh, I've, I've never really Unisex asked name? the question. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can top that. And the chicken farm was an egg farm or like a chicken chicken farm? Uh, but, uh, we had been both, but we were predominantly egg. Fa- uh, sorry, predominantly meat chickens. So my yeah. grandparents had held that property since the late fifties and were Australia's first con- commercial chicken growers. So I've always yeah. had long hours, uh, long hours, and hard work uh well well drilled into me from a young age and i'm sure that uh mum and dad having four children in the context of rising utility costs and rising labor costs were mm. <laughs> certainly factored into their decision to create a mini workforce yeah okay and now i have to ask you are you like did you go down like the vegan path because you saw all those chickens being tortured or are you love it chicken lover i <laughs> know uh, uh, uh no i i take i was quite lucky that more broadly we had a sustainable food perspective. So we also had cattle on our farm. So um, 
if there was a time when we would, mum and dad would pick out a good um, villa or a big, a good um, heifer for, for us to have. And then that, that um, villa would feed us for a year. So we, wow. yeah, the middle road of the sustainable, the sustainable path. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we've got the background now. Um, yeah. And then um, I, again, like typical A-type kid, did did all of the sports, um, always just striving to get the best grades growing up. Um, it was really important that I balanced both sport growing up and balanced school because otherwise I'm sure I would have had a few breakdowns a little bit earlier in my, <laughs> earlier in my life. I went to a selective high school in Newcastle and as any selective or private school student will tell you, you have three choices or four, maybe four choices. You either become a lawyer, you become a doctor, you become an engineer, or you get into accounting and finance. Yep. <laughs> so I had been going down the accounting or law path, but then I was um, very lucky to land a cadetship with PKF, previously Lawler Partners at the time when I was halfway through year 12. Mm-hmm. Uh, so dropped dropped the law side and uh, went down the commerce side. Okay. What, was that a part of the plan kind of thing that you um, wanted to do a cadetship instead of just going straight to uni or like uh, why, yeah. why, why accounting and not a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer? Uh, yeah, a, a great question. So uh, very pragmatic. Um I had wanted to always do commerce law. Again, it's driven by an ATAR mentality of, well, I need to get the highest ATAR and get into the most prestigious um, prestigious degree. Yeah. However, the reality is that unless you come from uh, a family that has the means, like it, it, um, going to prestigious universities in Australia is still incredibly expensive. So that boiled down to, well, I better get a cadetship because <laughs> it's expensive to go to university. And um, I also was incredibly worried about coming out of university and then fighting for all of the graduate spots in what is what I perceive to be very, very competitive. Mm, okay. Fair enough. And so you got you got the cadetship. Obviously, you had good marks at, at school. You went to selective school, so you know it was a no brainer for Lola to take you on. Um, was order your choice, or is that just something that you were allocated? And that was it, like baby. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in, I was really lucky. So at the time, the pro, they had a fan, they had a fantastic um, cadet program that was a, had a formal structure. And in that, you would rotate through each of the core business units. So I did oh. a month in insolvency, which I loved. I did a month in audit, which I didn't know that I would love going into because it had a really bad rap. And I did a month in business advisory, which is originally what I thought I wanted to go into. Um, so we were then at the end of that program asked to we could put forward our preference and I preferenced equally insolvency and audit. Mm -hmm. Insolvency didn't need a trainee at the time. So I was lucky to land in the audit team. Not everyone would say they were lucky to land in audit, but here we go. (laughs) No, I I mean, it was great. I mean, I was 18 and I was able to, I learned so much. We were always on site at the time. So I remember getting to do a floor tour at an abattoir. I got to um, do stock takes at supermarkets or for Australia's largest manufacturers and learning their systems and their processes and getting to walk through their factories and sites. Mm. is pretty cool when you're that age. That's what I thought as well. I thought it was the best thing in the world. Like I I did a cadet ship as well in audit. Loved exactly the same thing, just being out there and learning about different companies and talking to CEOs and CFOs. Yeah, and to, and to, yeah, exactly. Talking to so many people every day um, and really being pushed to know your stuff because yeah. um, you are put front and centre with quite senior people. Which at the age of like, 17 18 i had no idea i hadn't even started uni at the time uh, <laughs> i was like what is a debit or credit um, so yes getting pushed when you have no idea you're like you have to learn how to wing it sometimes as well and improvise. absolutely um 
curious question for you. What didn't you like about business advisory that made you not choose it as a preference? I liked the dynamics of insolvency and audit. So I was only in there for a month and I was very junior. So, Mm -hmm. and I didn't know a lot about accounting at the time. So I was doing very fundamental menial yeah <laughs> like tra- trial balance stuff and, and that's not to say that I wouldn't like it if I had my time again but yeah. that was just my experience in that very very first rotation it was great it just wasn't quite for me yeah okay I, I would feel the same way I mean I didn't have the same choice I think that what you guys experience was really cool I haven't come across that usually like a chip you kind of get allocated and then you stay there the fact that you could choose and yeah it was very was cool very unique yeah um, do they still do that now? Not in the same structure. So they, but they still, they still obviously take on trainees, but they don't do the rotation structure. So they've, they've got some other very cool learning and development mm. pathway programs that they do to supplement that now. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And that was a sandwich program where you like work full time part. And then yeah. So I, I worked full time and I also studied full time. You did. Okay. So you did both. Got you. Um, question for you in terms of like young accountants that are either going into uni and, and thinking of the same kind of pathway or graduating out of uni, what, what would you advise them to consider? Oh, some of the advice I always give is to be open-minded first and foremost So don't go in with a preconceived idea of what you want to do or where you want to be. Mm -hmm. Um, But that also applies more broadly to when you are speaking to people. And what I mean by that is there's often very, very bright and very, very keen either graduates or um, trainees coming through that will want to anticipate an answer or jump to a conclusion Mm -hmm. rather than taking the time to really listen to what someone's saying to them or being open to changing their position or or their view on something. So first and foremost, being open-minded. Second is being curious and asking good questions. So much of learning is self-directed in that Mm -hmm. perspective. Uh, and the third one I would say is don't be afraid to to change what you want to do, um, even if that can sometimes be a challenge. Well, what are you referring to, like, from your experience? Oh, I just think, I mean, like, it, it could be uh, they thought they wanted to be a tax accountant and mm. they actually want to be an audit or they want to be an insolvency um, or they um, really love this other part of what they're doing and yeah. um, they didn't think they would like it. But um, or, so having, or there's the other one around they've, they've studied for four years in a degree that they might not. Um, so having the courage to basically break the cord and start something fresh. Yeah, yeah ab- absolutely. And, and staying true to themselves. Yeah, okay. Um, is that what kind of led you to follow the path that you're following now? Uh, not necessarily. I think there was, um, there's, there's probably elements of that. Um, but I'm sure we'll get into that, you know, later on. Speaking of, I guess, change and following, you know, uh, different paths. If you weren't an accountant, what would you do? Well, it's funny that I'm not actually, I mean, I have my CA, um, I will never give that up, but I'm not actually employed as an accountant, uh, quote well, unquote. I now. use the generic umbrella term. <laughs> the, the air quotes. Uh, uh, I mean, look, I think I would. Like in I mean, hindsight, would you have ended up doing something else? I mean, I probably would have done law. Like I, I probably would have done law and I probably would have ended up in the same position where I was <laughs> um, really grateful for all of the experience and the exposure and the um, positions. But um, ultimately would have wanted to scratch an itch to do something a bit unique, but 
Mm. Um, when you're in school or when you're coming through university, you only know maybe those 10 different jobs that you can do. And now I'm um, working in a role that didn't really exist 10 years ago. And like I, when I try and explain it to my nan, like <laughs> she, it just doesn't quite um, translate. How do you explain it to her? I want to hear this. I mean, I, I mean, fundamentally, so I'm head of customer and growth at Yellow Canary, which is a one of Australia's fastest growing payroll reg tech reg techs. Uh, so my role there is the head of customer and growth, which is the title that um, sounds a bit made up, uh, is lo- uh, looking after everything from sales, BD, pipeline, marketing, through to um, the way that we deliver projects and ultimately the new product new products um mm. and sorry new products that we're developing uh, and building and bringing those to market and listening to what our customers want and um it's quite a quite a few hats and what's nan's reaction to that <laughs> she's always very proud <laughs> <laughs> but is she still on the farm like uh no she she moved off it a couple of years ago. Okay. Are your parents still on it? Like, is anyone actually still running the, the farm? Uh, no. So they entered into, again, my parents also were quite unconventional in the sense that my dad retired the first time at the age of 50 after selling um, selling the farm and had a sabbatical. So okay. um, they're now traipsing around Australia. <laughs> And are your brothers all like type A's as well? Were they all high achievers, or were you the kind of the the black uh, sheep? I I think we all have different. We all are striving to be successful, but that manifests in different ways. Yeah. Okay. Um, speaking of success, I guess what I wanted to ask you was like, what would you attribute your success to? Like that that meteoric rise to partnership what would you attribute that to for me it comes back to when i did start out my role um i was very aware that and it's not the same now but i was very aware that there was a lot of um there weren't a lot of female senior leaders or partners within the the professional services firm I was at at the time um, wasn't for a lack of trying, but I knew at that point that um, I don't think there I were wanted to female, create a path. I don't think there were any female order partners at the time, were there? Uh, there was one. There was um, one. There was sorry. There was one part, uh, female partner within the Sydney and Newcastle business at the time, um, yeah. and she's phenomenal. Like absolutely, absolutely incredible. Um, but, but that was largely it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so at that point I knew that I wanted to create a path for other, um, not only women, but young young people coming through the business to show that, um, there is a path here and, and create those opportunities for others. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the biggest motivating factor for you? Yeah, absolutely. So it's the striving to do, to cut a path that hasn't been, that no one has gone down before or not many. How I'm curious, like how long sided were you in terms of, you know, at what point did you decide, you know what, I'm just going to gun for it. Partner is, yeah, that's my, that's my vision board kind of thing. <laughs> uh, probably the first few weeks. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Cause I, I would imagine most cadets or grads would be like, yeah, okay. I just need to get my uni done and then I'll figure it out. I need yeah, to get my I CA think, done. And then yeah, I think I certainly thought of, thought of that. I, th- I think the seed was sown quite early from that first perspective. Um, I didn't always in like, I didn't think I would stay there forever, but I think once I was um, going down that path, the opportunity was incredible. So I wanted to, to see it out and, and follow through on that. Yeah. And what you said is actually um, really pertinent because I think a lot of people look at partnership as, you know, it, it does become a trap because once you're a partner, you're kind of like, that's it. You, you're meant to stay there. Like you've reached the pinnacle and you're meant to just enjoy the trappings of it. But yeah, you, you, you've chosen to take a different path, which is rare as well. Um, coming back to my previous question, like I'll rephrase it a little bit. What, what does it take to become a partner these, <laughs> these days? 
the answer no one likes that is hard work, long hours. Yeah. However, um, one of the things that I'm really grateful for my mentors and the training that they've they put me through as well is that is this concept of you need to balance the three hats of producer, manager, and leader. Mm-hmm. And to be a partner, you need all three. Yep. And you may be more dominant in some areas, but you need to be strong in all three. So that, I mean, I think that philosophy is particularly informative Mm -hmm. and I mean certainly in my experience and what I've seen from others who were promoted to partner at the same time is is the hard work the determination the ability to manage or balance all of those three hats Um, and it's also all those good things like bringing people along on the journey it's building your allies across the business and outside of the business Mm -hmm. it's building a compelling case for partnership in terms of why you, how are you going to serve the business? Because it's very much a two-way street in terms of what are you bringing to the table as a partner. Um, And I mean that not just in the sense of what fees and what clients are you bringing in, but how are you um, shaping the firm? How are you innovating? What's the legacy that you want to create? Okay. Wow. Well, what would you say you were strongest at out of the three? I haven't reflected on that, so it's a great question. Because it's hard to be all three. I think early, yeah, absolutely. I think early on, very early on prior to being a partner, I focused on being a producer as everyone is mm. um, as you as you move down that path. Um, I think both manager and being a manager and being a leader is a learned skills. Um, but I think I'd have to ask uh, my my mentoring partners as well. Like, where yeah. were the where were the weaknesses? And they're different skills as well. Um, like, uh, not everyone. Some people are good managers. Not everyone's a good leader. I find, and you know, I, I think a lot of people struggle with that because they feel like, yeah, cool, I'm a good manager. I can I can do this, but when the executive look at them, they don't see the leadership potential. Um, I don't yeah. know whether you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, and 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 it is. So the manager is very day to day, so it's it's heavy on execution. Like, can we deliver on this project? Whereas mm-hmm. the leader is taking that step back. It's um, I've heard it described as like going up to the to the balcony to get a look at what's happening on the the floor below. It's um, thinking about the strategy. It's thinking about it's thinking beyond tomorrow mm-hmm. and thinking about the long term um, because at the end of the day, there are a lot of people depending on you. Yep. Um, and I think that's something that carries a lot of weight and it's, yeah, it's moving beyond the tactical of being a manager and thinking about things through a strategic lens and making the hard decisions and having the, the tough, difficult conversations. When you say the tough conversations, are you referring to like your staff or clients or what? I think a bit, I mean, it's a bit of everything. I mean, tough conversations manifest in a number of different ways, but I'm sure as any partner will tell you, um, you can't, you can't shy away from either hard decisions or Mm. tough conversations just because you don't want to feel uncomfortable. Okay. How do you become a good manager or leader? You said they learn skills. And I, look, I know for some people it's a bit more natural than others. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like, A, what was it like for you? And B, how do you go about learning them? How do you develop those? Skills? Yeah. So I was very lucky in my time at PKF that they made a lot of investment in me and others coming through through formal training programs. Mm-hmm. So they brought on like external trainers or executive coach coaches to help build the leadership skills um, and those man- those more traditional management skills. I also was the beneficiary of um, a number of very good mentors who helped me um, develop that, including my sponsor partner who was pivotal to my development over that time. 
Um, but then I'm also just a big nerd and big reader. So <laughs> I've had my Harvard Business Review subscription for the last <laughs> couple of years. Um, and I even find just those articles that are just really pragmatic and really tactical um, are really useful in in filling those um, skill gaps or micro skills. Okay. And I imagine like a lot of it, you learn on the job as well. Like I'm, I'm sure there's enough, there's plenty of stuff ups. Oh yeah, absolutely. Always, always, always buy the things you don't want to remember. Um, <laughs> that yeah, offer the richest learnings. Yeah, because as much as we like to read and learn, um, at the end of the day, sometimes is, they usually say you have to get on the bike and fall a few times. Yeah, well. it's always, it's always, yeah, it's always when stuff goes wrong that you learn the most. You mentioned mentors quite a few uh, times. So I was going to touch it on that later. How important were they to your development and just to your success? Like, how, how big of a? You... I I think there's two things. I think there's a distinction there. So I think absolutely critical to my development. I would not be where I am today if it was not for mentors and sponsors but I think there's a distinction with the connection to success because I think success is different for everyone and I think if you view success purely through the lens of getting promoted to partner or getting promoted that that is not necessarily fulfilling to everyone um if that you're so single-sighted on career um at the expense of everything else but certainly that um to development and my progression critical um, cause again, they're the people that will have the hard conversation with you. They'll tell you the stuff you don't want to hear, but they're also, they'll also be your biggest supporter. Did it, was it something that you sought out and you said like, you know, you actually approach people and say, Hey, I actually want you to be my mentor. Or was it something that, you know, PKF or all the partners at the time organized and structured for you guys? Uh, it was a balance. So I, I, again, my, um, sponsor partner was um like a a natural mentor in that sense and and absolutely excellent uh then through the training programs they also brought in coaches Mm -hmm. um but then i also just sought out to learn from as many people as i could so i would never formally call them a mentor a number of the people that i catch up would catch up with but i certainly sought their counsel and guidance okay internally or external to externally okay but in the accounting industry um, no, usually more broadly. So usually, um, senior leaders in other businesses or with more diverse backgrounds. Okay. Because again, a lot of management and leadership is agnostic across professional services and you need perspectives that are outside of the industry, um, to not only get a different perspective, but mm-hmm. otherwise you become quite single sighted. Yeah. in terms of where you get your your learning and development from. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Like what for a young person that is in the professional services or anywhere in a career, like what is the best way to go about it? Because like you say, you know, it was kind of informal for you, but, you know, some people and there's a lot of organizations now pushing for like formal mentorship programs, et cetera. Like what, what's the best way to go about it, how to structure it, how to approach someone? Yeah. How regularly you should do it. Just want to get a bit yeah. of insight from you. And I think the answer is that it's different for everyone, but the key to a successful mentoring relationship is the ment- the mentee, I believe, in my experience, needs to seek it out. It mm-hmm. can't be a forced relationship where it's set up, this person's your mentor and, and just go away, like, go away yeah, and off you go. Okay. Um, for what I've seen in my own experience is most effective when the mentee actually seeks that out. They find mm-hmm. someone that has the skills that they're looking to fill or the experiences they're looking to learn from and then like seek out, like actively seek out that introduction, mm-hmm. whether that's a warm intro through someone they know who can um help get them in to have a, like to have a conversation with them or whether it's someone that they know. Um, I use the example of if, for example, someone's an auditor um, and they have access to a number of like execs or senior leaders within other businesses that may be clients, they may have relationships with them Mm -hmm. uh, and they may admire those individuals or, or benefit from catching up with them to leverage their experience as well. So it's such an easy get for um, p- 
people within professional services to um I was going to ask out their you, own relationships. I, I was thinking when you said like external to organization where the, you, you, you would have used your audit kind of network, but then, you know, how does that work with the conflict of interest element? Sorry, how does it work from the... Like a conflict of interest element. Where, oh, I, I mean... Because if you develop a relationship with them and you have to audit them at the same time. Oh, I mean, yeah, no, that, that's a great... Like, that's a great point. Um, Business services is fine, but audit is like, well, you know, I have to audit you. But I, well, I mean, that's surely it's an exercise in common sense then as well. Like, I think there's a difference between, um, and again, like when I talk about mentors as well, you may have someone that you catch up with once a year or or twice a year. Hmm. Um, there's, it's not, in, in my experience, it hasn't been the case where you're catching up with them every week as a formal yeah. mentor and it's falling into that risk category of a conflict of interest. How do you get the most out of those catch up? Like, did you come in with a list of questions or conversation topics and things you wanted to bounce ideas of? Or yeah, I, in my experience, preparation is key because I think it's it's a reflection of how much I value the other person's time. Yep. I think it's incredibly it can come off the wrong way if you don't come in there with an idea of why you actually are meeting that person. You need an objective. You don't need to have necessarily set a formal agenda but mentally yeah. you should have those dot points of, of what are the things that I want to get from this um I also take the approach that when you are reaching out to people that you want to have coffee with or want to get some mm-hmm. counsel or some guidance from when you do reach out if you don't have a warm intro um tailor 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 the cold the intro if it's cold particularly you want something that catches their attention if you don't know them and also with intros more broadly, I'd only ever be, I would ask them if they are available for, like available to meet sometime in the next couple of weeks. But And then when they say yes, I'd only ever be seeking 30 minutes, yep. no more than 30 minutes in their diary. And I would give them two to three suggested slots as a starter because it's really important that when you are reaching out to people that you aren't pushing that mental load or that effort Mm. onto them like you need to be incredibly respectful of their time and respectful that they have heaps going on so make it as frictionless and as easy for them to say yes as possible okay can you give us an example like an approach you use would you would you email them would you send them a linkedin message would you say it's you know hey i'm looking for a kind of an informal you know mentor like how would you just specifically what, what, what message would you send or how would you send that etc if yeah. it was a cold intro yeah the the answer is there it depends so it, let's say that i do not know them from a bar of soap yep. i have tried and i have no like no one in my network that knows them at all I've exhausted all other avenues of getting a warm intro. Um, Then I would reach, I mean, if I can get their email anywhere, I'll get their email. Mm -hmm. If I've also exhausted that avenue, um, I'll LinkedIn message them. And again, tailor it and just like, hey, um, that first, get rid of pleasantries first up, like just get straight to the point. So that, first sentence is really um like where did I either see them what's the interest like like why are they um like what's that unique in so if I've heard them on a podcast or yep. if I've seen them speak or if I've seen them in the paper um or I've seen them write an article it's acknowledging that and like this is what I got from that would you have time for like I I'm looking to learn this or I am looking to understand A, B, and C and you're the expert in X, Y, Z. I'd be really grateful if we could find 30 minutes over the next few weeks to um, for me to ask blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, and what would those things be like when you say expert? Because like most of it is generic leadership stuff. Like it's... Uh... And they're a leader of a particular organization. Yeah, um, well, I mean, it's a hundred. It's absolutely tailored to like why you want to be there, and I think that is in like that's up to the individual. Okay. Like it's very situational. Okay. And a lot of the time, you said you would prefer to use warm leads with someone with 
you know, you would ask one of your, someone you network to say, Hey, can you introduce me to such and such? I'd like to learn from them a little bit as well. Is that how you would? Yeah. And I'll send them the forwardable. So if they've, if I've spoken to them or if I've emailed them and I know they have a warm interest, like a warm, they've got, they know the person, like yep. they personally know the person, I'll send them a forwardable email. So again, it makes it as frictionless as possible for them to intro me to that person. And same sort of thing. Like, hey, yeah, and by there's the way, so many I... great affordable intro email templates out there on Google. Like it's they're not hard to find. Um, keyword affordable intro email. <laughs> okay, I love that. Um, and you mentioned like sponsoring partner. Was that once you got to that manager level and there were conversations about you becoming a partner that you got a sponsoring partner internally? I I was lucky so that the, the practice I was building was a national workplace compliance practice off the back of around about the time in Australia where 7-Eleven was hitting the press mm -hmm. um, and the partner I worked closely with on early projects that were similar to the 7-Eleven wage, wage underpayment project is the one that also helped, um, helped me and, and sponsored me to build the workplace compliance practice. Mm. And I think it... Can we talk a bit more about that just so listeners understand? It wasn't like you were an auditor, you got given this parcel of fees and, you know, you kind of grew to become a partner randomly. Well, not randomly, but systematically, I guess. You kind of had to, from my impression, build your own partnership. Yeah. So back in 2016, um, around the time that the 7-Eleven wage out payment case was hitting the press, uh, I was working on a similar project for another ASX 20 company mm -hmm. and that we were doing fr effectively franchise audits for for that business to work out if there was any wage theft or underpayment or any of mm -hmm. the issues that 7-Eleven were incur um that 7-Eleven were having at that business <laughs> turns out they were <laughs> and we that led into a larger project with that business and a number of other projects to help them with that audit process and the review process, which was quite different. So it's, it wasn't an external audit or internal audit. Um, we basically had to make up an audit program mm -hmm. that... It was a compliance audit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a compliance audit. So um, falling more into that workplace um, and award compliance space. So from there, um, with the support of the um, my sponsor partner, we built off that opportunity and got intros into Australia's other largest retailers and mm -hmm. built that into built that into a standalone business and we grew that from beyond the Sydney and Newcastle practice and built that to be a national practice. Mm -hmm. And from there that that's what I oversaw um, in my time as partner. Okay. And that was your baby that you grew then. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. And I had one like I wonderful, wonderful team that we brought in, all super switched on and yeah, they're absolutely guns and, and had they had equal part in, in helping us grow that business too. Okay. What would you say was some of the like biggest hurdles or biggest challenges on your path to partnership? Building a recurring revenue pipeline. <laughs> Because of the type of compliance work, whether it's is it once off or is it recurring? Yeah, yeah, it can be. So a lot of the large wage reviews can be once off. So yeah. the challenge is in building recurring revenue offerings that are more product based. Um, because one of the things they don't tell you when you want to be partner is uh, at the end of the day, you are the fees that you bring in. Yeah. Um, because people are people are paying their mortg mortgages based on the wages that you're paying them. Mm. And like there is great responsibility in that. And that means you've got to keep filling the pipe, which is challenging, but equal parts exciting. How did you go about doing that? Especially since you're like, as you said, your business was built on one off reviews. Yeah, we were lucky that we had a very, very strong referral network. So a lot of the law firms that we may have worked with would refer us in for other engagements. Um, we mm -hmm. also leveraged other other connections or other opportunities that we had. Yeah, okay. Talking a bit besides the like recurring revenue, was there anything else people don't tell you about what it's like being a partner or the path to partnership? <laughs> All the hard bits. I mean, 
at the end of the day, professional services is, is a people business. Mm. So looking after our people, developing our people, um, growing our people and keeping everyone accountable always just provides a wealth, a wealth of challenges. Um, this is that the greatest challenge to people? Yeah, but not for not in a bad, like not in a bad way. Like I just yeah. think again from a personal responsibility of wanting to um, make sure that they're growing and satisfied and, and feeling fulfilled, um, not on the rare occasions where it's just like keeping people accountable. Hmm. Okay. In terms of, I, I guess, that journey from cadet to senior to manager to partner, Walk us through in terms of the different as like how you grew in that role and what different aspects you had to focus on. Because I'm, I'm just for the benefit, I guess, of listeners that are sort of in their younger stages of their career, what that journey looks like and what steps they should be taking, or just in general, what it looks like. You know, how yeah, what do you, what do you focus on? There's broad principles that apply throughout, and I'll start with those. So again, it comes back to being open-minded and being curious. Hmm. Uh, it also comes out to seeking out opportunities. So seeking out opportunities to learn, seeking out opportunities to understand, seeking out opportunities to work with different people and work on different things. So you really early in your career want to go, um, you want to go wide. So go wide in terms of skills, experiences, um, people you work with, just the more diversity in the mix, the better. Um. And then as you go through the stages, I think the most challenging one people find is that when they finish their CA, they're now typically a senior or knocking on the door of being a supervisor or assistant manager. Uh, The challenge is then from being a producer. So being, I'm really great at my work. I can get stuff done. I can just push, push work out to flipping that and then delivering through people. Mm -hmm. Uh, And by that, I mean, you're no longer the one that can get through the volume of work that you have. You have to learn to effectively delegate. You have to learn to bring people along. You have to learn to um, provide feedback, keep them accountable, uh, and you really step into the role of being a manager or a supervisor. Okay. And then did the role change much from being a, a manager to a partner? Yeah. So it changes in the sense that you're, Again, you're responsible for strategy as a partner. You're responsible for the long view. And at the end of the day, the buck stops with you. Yeah. So everything, um, everything that your team does and everything that anyone around you does, it really falls back to you and you have to own that. Um, and that means that whenever stuff goes wrong or whenever um, you need to change things or you think there's a better way of doing it, ultimately, like it's up to you to make that change happen not as an individual but through the team but ultimately the buck stops with you okay having the benefit of hindsight what would you have done differently in your sort of career to date i wouldn't have changed anything in the sense that i think all of the experiences that i've had have contributed to where i am and made it more um certainly more rich Um, I think one of the hardest things about working full-time, like doing full-time work since the age of 18 whilst also studying full-time, going straight through into CA, um, this is all in your like late teens and and most of your 20s, working 60-plus hour weeks are the sacrifices and the toll that it takes in your relationships and and making sure that you are a well-rounded person. So in hindsight, I definitely sacrificed, not sacrificed, I put a lot of the, a lot of the personal relationships in my life second earlier on in my career. Like the amount of times that I was sitting at home on a Saturday night working on proposals and tenders um, and had would have to say no to mates' birthday parties or mm. um, get-togethers, like... <laughs> At the end of the day, that in hindsight, those are the things I would change, not any of the life decisions Which that is, I've, all the career decisions I've made. I mean, we're talking about the hard work part. 
would you have had had you gone to all those parties instead of putting the tenders and proposals would you have become partners quickly though no and i'm sure um <laughs> so it becomes a bit of a conundrum right yeah ab- absolutely yeah. and then it becomes the question becomes well what what do i optimize sorry the question becomes what do i value and what's important to me mm. and that change the answer is that that changes over time as well yeah but which is, which is why like i think a lot of people confuse balance sorry to interrupt um it's people think balance as a bal- equally balanced at the same time and i you know i think the from what i've heard from highly successful people that have come to that realization as you have as well it's like it's it's about prioritizing different things at different times but making sure all the aspects get a priority at some point in time mm-hmm. um because you can never have them equal like at, at, yes. at one point in time it's impossible because you'll spot on and i think apologies if this is not a sweary podcast however i think it's, you can swear as much as you can amazing i think balance is a load of shit and yeah. i think that particularly I think it's a trap for everyone. I think it's particularly a trap for women, particularly women who are considering families or have families mm. because it's, and particularly within professional services structures that have not typically been quote unquote family friendly or had structures in place to support people, men and women that want families or have families, it creates yeah, the concept of balance creates a trap and no one wins from that. So what, what's the answer then? How do you balance? The golden question. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is a tough one and it's one that won't change overnight. And it's a um, personal one as well because everyone, yeah, absolutely. everyone manages their, and runs their absolutely. lives and families in such different ways. Yeah. Absolutely. But I think broader cultural change um, will be the only way that it becomes better for people in terms of being able to prioritise their time or prioritise what's important mm. to them, needs cultural cool. change and, and acceptance and flexibility and, and yeah. all of those good things. Eddie, I was wondering, we talked about like, especially being a female, what was it like being a young female or a partner sitting in boardrooms and just, you know, dealing with all the executives that you had to, especially in, I mean, you grew up in Newcastle, a lot of your clients are probably regional slash metro. Um, tell us a bit more about that experience, being young and being female. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of my clients were actually, um, I mean, As partner, they're all national, so a lot of them were capital city based. But I think, I mean, Mm -hmm. parking, parking that anytime you are different or not the majority, there's certainly a higher expectation of you that you're acutely aware of um, and you know you need to be the most well-prepared in the room. You need to be the most considered and... Mm -hmm very because the spotlight is on yeah you. absolutely the spotlight's definitely on you uh and something you're acutely aware of i was again very lucky to have the the support of uh, my sponsor partner and the other um, partners within the business but there's certainly an element of um kind of cultural change in that in that as well hmm but I- any particular, I don't know, examples or, or issues that, you, you know, where you felt like, uh, you know, it's very different being a young female order partner right here compared to if I was a male order partner and I was older. Oh, I mean, yeah, look, I mean, being 20 years, 20 years younger than the next youngest partner and a woman, like there have definitely been times where I have either been to clients or, or other meetings where, the expectation was that, oh, like, are you the assistant or um, are you, like, here to get coffee? But I think on the whole, I was, uh, it, nothing was, yeah, too bad. Okay. But is there any, any advice you would give to females wanting to become a partner and how to assert themselves or um, be taken seriously? Especially, in a, I think that's for everyone that's young, number one, but also 
um, as a female, there's you know an additional sort of issue, as you said before, because people go like, "Are you, are you here to get a coffee or something?" Yeah, and look, I think my opinion's changed on that over time, and I think it really is up to the men in the room, not the women in the room. So I think it's mm-hmm. again, I think it's a bit of BS that it should always be up to the woman to assert herself, and it's really important that the men or the people that are already in the room hold a mirror up to themselves and that not only the women look at how am I showing up and asserting myself, but the men, the men are actually looking at, well, how am I creating an inclusive space where everyone, not just women, feel psychologically safe to speak up and mm-hmm. creating a space where they listen and let them be heard. Yeah, okay. I think mean, that's powerful. Um, but for you, you found that, well, what I'm hearing is like you had to, you feel like you had to work harder and be more prepared because the spotlight was always on. Yeah, you. absolutely. Okay, which probably paid off. <laughs> I would imagine. What are some of the things that you believe in that may the many others would disagree and or think that you're crazy about? That people with a different perspective or different experiences will be the ones that change the world rather than the people who just show up every day and um, keep doing what they've always done. Hmm. Hasn't, hasn't that always been the case? The ones that... Oh, I, I just mean in terms of like a more traditional path. So yeah. um, working harder in a traditional space will get you the same result or a result that someone has already gotten before. Um, Mm. Whereas it's, yeah, the people that take a more wacky or offbeat or or unconventional approach that it'll pay off down the track. And that comes back to being authentic, I guess. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really good way of putting it. Being true to yourself. Yeah. Okay. What's your end game? I don't know. What are your long-term goals? Yeah, I don't know. And I, and I think that there's, um, there's power and beauty in being able to say, I don't know where the end game is. I think for me, the thing that pulls it all together in terms of the overarching vision is the ability to create a space, um, to, pardon me, the ability to create a space and bring women and people on diverse backgrounds along the journey Um, and provide a platform for them because unlocking the power of women and unlocking the power of people from diverse backgrounds is actually an economic, um, not only an economic argument, but also a social argument and ultimately Mm. leads to to better business outcomes. It leads to more creativity, more innovation. Um, So my overarching vision or something that I'm striving towards is always trying to platform and create space and, and bring those people up the ladder, regardless of what others may say or think. Okay. You know, you, you said like, and this will be the last question I'll start wrapping up. Um, you mentioned sitting there on Saturday nights, doing the proposals, the tenders, probably you know, reviewing work papers, etc. How do you, how do you maintain a level of motivation and discipline, especially at that young age where, as you said, you know, people want to party, you got friends, you got partners etc how do you keep on that course well I think there's no point to motivation if you don't know what you're striving for so I think Mm -hmm. again I think motivation is a is another one of those bs concepts Uh, I think it's discipline and I think it's discipline to achieve the goal for me the goal at that time was becoming partner and building that practice and doing something really worthwhile rather than I'm being super motivated. It's it's more relying on habit and discipline. How do you develop or do that? Because a lot of people have that goal. They're like, oh, I want to be, you know, an Ironman. I want to be a partner. They have all these lofty goals. Very few people actually achieve them. So what, what's that distinction there? Yeah. Well, ag- again, it's just, it's discipline. So I think that's quite easy if you've come from a sporting background where you've got the traits of discipline. So you know mm-hmm. what it is, what it means. And it's, to use a sporting analogy, it's getting up at 5 a.m. every day to go to training. It's being accountable to your teammates in a work context. It's it's knowing that, well, I've made a commitment to get this tender done because we need to submit it by 
9 a.m monday to win this work because that work is crucial to what we're building here but also to the growth and security of our team fair enough rapid fire questions go for it um what's your favorite quote i have two don't ask don't get Mm -hmm. and i like that one yep uh, ask for forgiveness not permission did you have to employ that one a few times in your career? I I employ both of them every day. <laughs> um, what have you read or watched or learned recently that's had the most impact on you? Recently or in the past? Oh yeah, okay. Uh, in the past, I was going to say in the past is good. I love in terms of book um, books, Man's Search for Meaning by yep. Victor L. Wonderful. Frankel. Apologies yep. if I've gotten that wrong. Uh, again, everyone should read that book. You'll smash it out in a day, but it will change your life. Uh, mm-hmm. The second book that I love and recommend is Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Uh, listen to the audiobook is is my recommendation there. Um, and, yeah, include the link in the show notes. He's excellent. And yeah. my third, oh, uh, it would have to be, I'll always go blank on it and that's probably I mean that's probably saying something as well so I might just leave it at two and if I remember the third one we'll pop it in the show notes um what have you bought recently that's had an impact on you I don't know any purchases they're like that was the most useful thing I've ever bought oh well the most recent thing I bought is actually a pair of Ugg boots because I'm working from home a lot and I get cold feet. So <laughs> uh, I, you could say work, I mean, a work shoes in that sense. Indeed. Who would you have a drink with, um, past or present? Or who would you want to have a drink with the most in the world? Um, apart from family members, past and present. Who? I would have to say Victor L, sorry, Victor Frankel. Okay. What would you ask him? I would ask what was it that got him through on the darkest days? I like that. Baby, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been a pleasure, Michael. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Thank you for tuning in and hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like our podcast and share it on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, wherever it is you hang out so more people can benefit from these speakers. Also, please subscribe on our website so you get all of our latest episodes. And if there's anything else I can help you with or you have speakers you'd love to hear from, or some feedback about the current episode, please feel free to send an email to michael at recruitmentexpert.com.au. Until then, take care, and I look forward to connecting with you in the future.